Hello there. In this video, I'd like to begin talking to you about what a representation is in quantum mechanics. And you'll see pretty rapidly that we're talking about basis states. The two videos previous to this which are most relevant are where I discuss the language of eigenvalue equations and when I introduced quantum states, quantum operators and Hermitian operators. You'll see that, in my opinion, a lot of the difficulties associated with quantum mechanics come down to issues of language. And hopefully this video will help to tie down perhaps the language used by your instructor, by your textbooks and other reference materials you have with regard to representations and basis states. So let's begin. I feel it's important to start at the start and certainly I don't mean to insult your intelligence but I'd like to briefly recap on what vectors are. A vector is something which has a magnitude and a direction. And I'd suggest that the vectors you're very familiar with, you understand intuitively. You can understand what a thing like, excuse me, what some, something like a force is or velocity or acceleration, weight or momentum. In many ways, these are things that we see in our everyday world. So they're not abstract quantities, they're intuitively understood. And this is very important because in quantum mechanics, the vectors are in fact abstract and they're not so readily understood. Also, we have lots of different ways of mathematically representing vectors. Here on the right hand side of your screen, I have three such ways of doing so. Perhaps people like to have the arrow on the top, or the squiggly line, or what I prefer is to have the straight line underneath the vector. And if you're looking at a textbook, most likely the letter is simply bolded. And what I'm trying to illustrate here is that, already with our normal study of vectors, we have lots of different ways of representing the same information. Quantum mechanics is no different. In fact, perhaps quantum mechanics takes this to the nth degree. So while you're already studying a relatively complex topic, it isn't made any easier by the fact that the terminology and nomenclature is so varied. So hopefully I'll be able to help you tie that down in your head. Let's move on. So general quantum states or quantum state vectors are mathematically represented by things which we know as kets. And kets are abstract vectors. So in the center of your screen, I have the ket psi, in fact, psi sub n. And this is an abstract quantum state or our quantum state vector. And there are other words which we can use to describe this, but for the moment, we'll say it's either a ket or a quantum state vector. And it's important to know that these kets are abstract vectors they don't behave in the same way that the normal vectors you're used to do. So for example, they behave differently to forces, velocities, accelerations, and so on. So we're talking about quantum state vectors. And a quantum state, of course, has various properties. It has properties such as position, energy, and momentum, and so on. And in quantum mechanics, we refer to these as observables. So mathematically, if you want to measure an observable, you must apply what's known as an operator on the particular ket, on your quantum state vector. And this is known as operating on the ket. So in the, in the center of your screen, I have a general operator, A. Now if it's got this little hat, it implies that we're talking about an operator. So what you're looking at here is the operator A acting on the quantum state vector psi sub n. And this results in what's known as an eigenvalue equation, as illustrated in the bottom center of your screen. I will talk more about eigenvalue equations in this video, but I refer you to the previous video where I discussed the language of eigenvalue equations. So on the top of your screen, we have the same eigenvalue equation. And we'll talk about the elements of that now in a moment. Basically, the operator operates on the ket and produces the same ket. However, it gives us a multiplicative constant, which we know as the eigenvalue of the operator. So looking at our eigenvalue equation, we have our operator, we have our quantum state vector, and we see that when you operate on the quantum state vector, we get back the same quantum state vector, but simply with a multiplicative constant or a scalar. And that's known as the eigenvalue of the operator. So, the operator measures 
the value of an observable of a property of your quantum state. It gives us back the same quantum state. However, it gives us a multiplicative constant which is known as the eigenvalue of the quantum state. And this is the value of the observable or the property you're looking to, to measure. Now the eigenvalue is associated with the operator. So here's our eigenvalue and it's associated with the operator. So for example, if the operator was our momentum operator, well then this would be the momentum eigenvalue or the value of momentum. If this was the position operator, well then our eigenvalue would be that of position and it would be associated with the position operator. Now, clearly we're talking about eigenvalue equations and that's part of the reason that the language starts to broaden. Because we're talking about quantum state vectors, but they're in an eigenvalue equation. So some people refer to them as eigenstates or eigenvectors, or perhaps simply kets or even eigenkets. But they are all of the operator A in this case. So these are, let's say, eigenstates of the operator A. And these are the eigenvalues of the operator A. Now, due to the properties of operators known as Hermitian operators, or perhaps Hermitian matrices or functions, all operators associated with quantum observables must be Hermitian. Now, this mightn't mean much to you, but I can assure you a small bit of study, and this will be figured out very, very rapidly, and there's no need for me to, to, to spend some time discussing Hermitian operators. However, the reason we use Hermitian operators in quantum mechanics is that by definition, the eigenvalues associated with Hermitian operators are real numbers, as opposed to being imaginary numbers. And we saw already that the eigenvalues in our eigenvalue equation correspond to our observables. They correspond to position, to energy, to momentum, and so on. And these obviously are all real quantities, as opposed to imaginary quantities. So it only stands to reason that we need Hermitian operators or matrices or functions in order to calculate or measure observable quantities in quantum mechanics. So to say it once more, in our eigenvalue equations, our eigenvalue will be a real number if our operator is a Hermitian operator. And I urge you, don't get bogged down in what a Hermitian operator is for the moment. Its properties are important and they're very, very useful. However, for at the moment, don't get bogged down in that. Accept it and let's move on. The important point is that Hermitian operators or Hermitian matrices produce real eigenvalues. And that's very important. So we've seen basically on physical grounds that our operators in quantum mechanics must be Hermitian. But we get a very nice result in return, an unintended consequence in many ways. One of the properties of Hermitian operators makes them particularly useful for quantum mechanics. And that is that eigenstates of Hermitian operators can be used as a basis for other states. Now, what's a basis? This is something you're very familiar with. Think about your Cartesian space, your physical space around you. You can use cylindrical coordinates or can use spherical coordinates to describe your space. But just as easily, you can use another basis. You can use your rectangular coordinate system and use your unit vectors i hat, j hat, and k hat as the basis for your space, for your Cartesian space. And the phrase we use is i hat, j hat, k hat unit vectors are able to span the space. Now, in quantum mechanics, we're talking about thing, a thing that's known as Hilbert space, and that's where our quantum state vectors live. And by definition, if you have eigenstates of a Hermitian operator, those eigenstates can be used to span the space in the same way as i hat, j hat, and k hat can span your Cartesian space. And this means that all other quantum states can be described in terms of the eigenstates of Hermitian operators. Now, while we might be losing at this point, I urge you to hold on because it will become very clear very shortly. So, by definition, and this is a quick recap rather than getting uh, bogged down in the specifics, something can be used to span a space or to be a basis for a space if the vectors are complete, they're orthogonal and can be normalized. 
and I've given the mathematical definitions here, but I don't want to get bogged down on it. The point is that the eigenstates of Hermitian operators satisfy these particular criteria and can be used to span our Hilbert space where our quantum state vectors live. So as we've said, the eigenvalues of Hermitian operators are real as opposed to being imaginary. We know that the eigenstates of Hermitian operators can be used as a basis for other quantum state vectors because they are complete, they are orthogonal to each other in a mathematical sense and can be normalized. So let's see if we can explore this idea with a brief example. Let's look at the energy eigenvalue equation. So we're talking about energy, so we need the energy operator, which is known as, excuse me, it's known as the Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian is given by H with a hat in it. And of course, when the Hamiltonian acts on our quantum state vectors, we're going to get back the same quantum state vector with a multiplicative constant. And this, of course, is going to be our energy eigenvalue. So here we have the Hamiltonian energy operator, which is a Hermitian operator. We have our energy eigenstates. And these, as I said a moment ago, can be used to span the Hilbert space because it happens that they are eigenvalues of Hermitian operator matrix. And we get a real energy eigenvalue of the state E sub n. So, in order for us to be able to span the space, in order for us to be able to describe an arbitrary quantum state vector, or ket, using these energy eigenvalues, what we need to do is take a linear combination of them in this fashion here. In the exact same way as you would take a linear combination of your i hat, j hat and k hat unit vectors in order to describe an arbitrary vector in Cartesian space. And here's where we get to the crux of the argument. That we define a representation as being when the eigenstates of a particular quantum operator, or its kets, are used as a basis for representing other quantum states. And we do so using a linear combination of those basis kets. So, to close this particular video segment, For physical reasons, operators in quantum mechanics must be Hermitian operators. When we operate on a quantum state vector using one of these observable operators, we get an eigenvalue equation. And the eigenstates of our quantum operator are able to be used to span the space and to describe an arbitrary quantum state vector. And we do so by taking a linear combination of the basis kets. Now, operating on an arbitrary quantum state vector changes it, and it becomes an eigenstate or an eigenvector or an eigenket of the operator. So consider for a moment we have an arbitrary quantum state vector psi, and we have no idea what state this is in. However, we want to measure a particular observable associated with the operator A. What we're going to do is we're going to operate on the quantum state vector. In doing so, the system must decide what state it's in. So it's going to collapse or project onto that particular observable and it's going to become into one of the eigenstates of the operator. So if we're talking about the operator A hat, this is just an arbitrary operator, its eigenstates are represented using the kets A sub n. If we have an arbitrary quantum state vector psi, it's not necessarily in one of these quantum states. However, the second we measure the quantum state using the operator A, the quantum state is going to collapse or project into the, the states, the eigenstates of the operator. And we're going to get the associated eigenvalue equation. And out of this is going to pop the eigenvalue associated with the particular observable. And once we know the eigenstates associated with the operator, we're able to take those in a linear combination to represent any arbitrary quantum state vector. And that's all I've got to say for now. So, thank you for watching. Please pass it on to your friends and visit universityphysicstutorials.com. Thank you.